Peace family, y'all know who it is. It's Bakari Lumumba, back once again to ProgenitiveLumumbaSpeaks.com, a black empowerment initiative where we believe we could gain a competitive advantage by always betting on black. Back with another video. Before we do, before we dive into what we're going to be discussing today, got to make sure you pay the cost to be the boss. What does that mean? I know many of you have been watching my videos and much appreciation to the, to, in these YouTube streets. But I need you all to make sure that you subscribe and the like button and click on that notification bell. I don't want anyone to ghost watching my videos. I want everyone who watches to subscribe. We have a goal of trying to monetize our channel. We need to get to 1,000 subscribers by the end of summer. And only YOU can help us do that here at LamobaSpeaks.com. So before we get into it, I want to make sure that we also invoke the wisdom of our ancestors and honor the moral obligation to a member by channeling the wisdom of one Fannie Lou Hamer. Many of you may be aware of who Fannie Lou Hamer is. She's the queen mother who was the co-creator, co-president. Um, some people even say co-conspirator, right? Depending on where you're leaning um, politically of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. She's the sister who taught us that she was sick and tired of being sick and tired. But more importantly, she taught us to never forget where we come from and always praise the bridges that carried us over. And so the bridge that I want to make sure I praise today is one, Marcus Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League. And so many may be asking the question, why are you choosing to uh, highlight Marcus Garvey and the UNIA ACLU today? And I'm so glad that you asked that proverbial question. I'm going to give you an answer. The reason why is today, August 1st, 2022, 108 years ago today, August 1st, 1914, in Kingston, Jamaica, Marcus Garvey created the UNIA ACLU, right? As a racial uplift movement. As we all know, Marcus Garvey traveled to Central America, traveled to post Costa Rica, traveled to the UK, traveled to Panama, working for the United Fruit Company. Um, and what he found was that black people were being treated, dis mistreated, no matter where they were. They would be paying, they would be, they were being paid less wages. They were being, uh, they were the subjects of political. Uh, malfeasance, social abuse, economic um, castration, and of course, um, exploitation. And so Garvey said, that, where is the black man's flag? Where is his president? Where is his army, his navy, his man of big affairs? Finding on Garvey said, I will help create them. And so he did so 100 years ago today with the goal of one God and one aim, one destiny, with the singular goal of African liberation at home and Abroad. And so we want to make sure that we honor Marcus Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, Communities League, excuse me. And we know that many people nowadays question, is Pan-Africanism dead? And I'm going to be doing a video on this coming up. And I think it's important that we understand, I would argue that it's on life support. And I'm saying this, and I am a Pan-Africanist because we know we have to be our own worst critics sometimes, our biggest critics. But I think Pan-Africanism doesn't live on. And we're going to touch, in, touch on how that was the case. We know Garvey, unfortunately, when he was... Um, found guilty of mail fraud and sentenced to federal prison in Atlanta. He said that the, that the tiger may be, may be caged, but my cubs are still running, running free and running wild. And so we're going to touch on that a bit. But what I'm going to talk about first and foremost, when we talk about Marcus Garvey, the University of Negro Improvement Association, Garvey believed in black power global black power. He believed that the only way black people would be able to gain power is one, through the ideology of race first, and then second is what through economic empowerment. He says nothing comes before politics, before industry. Politics doesn't come before industry. Sociology doesn't become, come before industry. Philosophy doesn't come before industry. Industry must come first. And so Garvey states, and I'm reading from Tony Martin, who was the world's leading uh, Garvey uh, scholar before his passing, unfortunately, but Tony Martin, reading from the book here, Race Folks, The Ideological and Organizational Struggles of Marcus Garvey and Universal Negro Improvement Association. If you ever get a chance, please check this out. Tony Martin, I said it before, was the preeminent Garvey scholar throughout the world until his death. But he talks about what Marcus Garvey stated, and I quote, In a world full of wolves, one should go armed. And one of the most powerful defense weapons within the reach of Negroes is the practice of race first in all parts of the world, right? And so when we talk about Garvey's uh, Universal Negro Improvement Association, what was the doctrine? There was a doctrine. He encouraged his followers to support their black businessmen 
and professionals to erase catchism used by his followers, disabused minds of black folk concerning the claims of the Hamitic myth by examining that contrary to this myth, black people were certainly not the recipients of some biblical curse. He frowned upon advertisements of racially demeaning nature. The Negro World sponsored beauty contests and published photographs of beautiful black women, a subject, a subject on which Garvey writes poetic, Black queen of beauty, thou hast given color to the world. Indeed, practically every aspect of organization was designed to bolster the black man's self-esteem and to foster, foster pride in himself. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. even stated in 1965 while he was on sabbatical in Jamaica, in which he visited the grave of Martin Marcus Garvey. He said that Garvey was the first man of color to lead and develop a mass movement. He was the first man on a mass scale and level to give millions of Negroes a sense of dignity and destiny and make the Negro feel he was somebody. So when we talk about the Universal Negro Improvement Association, we're familiar with um, Marcus Garvey's most audacious industrial adventure, right? The Black Star Line. What many people don't know that the Black, that Universal Negro Improvement Association had branches throughout the world. It's literally organ the Negro world was printed in three languages, English, French, and Spanish, and had a circulation from New York City to Australia, that even in colonial Africa, if you were caught reading the Negro world, you were subject to imprisonment, because that's how powerful the gospel of Garveyism and African redemption, that's how powerful it was throughout the world, right? But I think what's most important is I want to talk about the influence of Marcus Garvey and UNIA, right? So many people may be unaware of that, Arthur A. Schomburg, many people, if you've ever been to Harlem, New York City, shout out to Harlem, you know, the far, fastest way, the Harlem is the A train, right? Uh, but if you go to 135th Fifth Street and Lenox Avenue, uh, we have the Schomburg Center for Black Research and History here. And Arthur Schomburg, who was a Puerto Rican bibliophile, was a columnist and a writer for the Negro World newspaper. Zora Neale Hurston, we know her latest book, uh, Bear Cohn, who talks about the last black cargo. She was a writer for the, for the Negro World newspaper. T. Thomas Fortune was an editor. J.A. Rogers, the historian, was a writer. Carter G. Woodson, Dr. Carter G. Woodson of Black Negro History Week, which became Black History Month fame. The man who was known for his most seminal text, Miseducation of the Negro. The man who created the Association for the Study of African American Life and History got his start with Marcus Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association. When we talk about Marcus Garvey, he said that the tiger is caged, but his pups are running wild. What are those pups that he was speaking of? We're talking about one, uh, uh, Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. We know that uh, Colin Grant, in his uh, great bi biographical work of Marcus Garvey, here we have in the Negro with they hat, the rise and fall of Marcus Garvey, documents that Elijah Muhammad was a corporal in Marcus Garvey's organization in Detroit and took the concepts of self-help, doing for self, economic independence, and took those teachings and created what we now know and call the Nation of Islam back in June of 1930, some 92 years ago. We can speak of Malcolm X and the creation of the Organization of African American Unity, right? We know Malcolm X's two parents were followers of one of Marcus Garvey. They were Garveyites and that his mother well, of course, was not only a regional editor, but also a columnist for the Negro World newspaper. We could think of one Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana, who was able to successfully lead the first sub-Saharan African nation out of what colonialism, against the vicissitudes of colonialism. And he stated, even though he had a PhD in economics, that the most important book that he ever read was the philosophies and opinions of, of course, one Marcus Garvey. We could think of the International African Friends of Abyssinia, Right, Joe Mo Kenyatta, George Padmore, Ash, Ashwood Garvey, ITA, Wallace Johnson, all these individuals were influenced by the teachings and philosophies of Warner Marcus Garvey. Fans Fanon, Black Skin, White Mask, right, um, Wretched of the Earth, Towards the African Revolution, influenced by Warren Fans Fanon. So we see that we have a long list of individuals who have engaged in organizing in the Black radical tradition of, of, of audacious self assertion in the face of white hegemony. But we also know that one of Marcus Garvey is seen as the preeminent um, and preeminent pan Africanist of the modern era. Uh, but we want to go back and look at a little bit of history, right? When we talk about that audacious, uh, that black radical tradition of audacious self-assertion in the face of white hegemony. Before Marcus Garvey, we had what? Henry Sylvester Williams, 
coining the term Pan-Africanism, creating the Pan-African Association in 1897, and creating what the Pan-African Conference in 1900. We have what Bishop Henry Manil Turner in 1891 and the African Methodist Episcopal Church, who, who had the um, audacity, the unmitigated gall, to say that a Christian conference full of his white uh, colleagues and compatriots, that God was black, right? We have one Alexander Cromwell, who repatriated to Liberia. We have one, the uh, late great Dr. Martin, Martin R. Delaney, the father of black nationalism, who was the one who first coined the term, what, Africa for the African, which was, of course, popularized by Marcus Garvey at the turn, in the early 20th century. We have Paul Kufi, who, of course, was the first to organize uh, African-American repatriation to the continent. So there's a lot that we could touch on, but I wanted to make sure that I just took this time to honor the moral obligation to a member. And that is the honor that 108 years ago, August 1st, 1914, Kingston, Jamaica, Marcus Garvey created the Universal Negro Improvement Association African Communities League with, under the mission and title of One God Ain't One Destiny, One Destiny, with the goal of African redemption at home and abroad. And many people may be questioning why August 1st? Because August 1st is the Emancipation Day in Jamaica. August 1st was the day that uh, the British um, abolished chattel enslavement in the West Indies, particularly in Jamaica. So Marcus Garvey chose that day as the day that he would, what, create the University of New York Improvement Association. But just wanted to take some time to honor the work of Marcus Garvey and the University of New York Improvement Association and know that we also know the UNIA created the what, Pan-African flag, represent us not as a nation state, but as a nation of people. And just to make sure that we, we make sure that we lift our ancestor up and give him all the glory and praise that of course he is due. And until next time, you all know what to do. Peace. Before you go, make sure you hit the subscribe and like button. Thank you for supporting the channel. And remember, here at Lumumba Speaks, we always bet on black. Peace.